1 John chapter 2. And by the way, I want to say this. I was telling somebody. I, I didn't realize that Sunday school is like 1 John. Todd's been teaching 1 John in Sunday school. I didn't realize that until last, this last week. So maybe the Lord's trying to tell us something. Uh, but we want to begin uh, a little where we left off last week. and have a little more of a review. We've been talking about... Uh, John's purpose in writing this letter to the church. We're going to begin in chapter 2 and verse 18 <clears throat> and talk a little bit about, you know, they, were, they left us because they weren't of us and talk about everything we've been saying so far. We remember, I'd like to remind you that John wrote this epistle to address heresies that were coming into the church, Gnostic heresies. Um, is it a little chilly in here? Is it? Miss Lou, you want to kick it up a couple notches there? Okay, she's my she's our, our thermostat minister back there. She's okay. Uh, not too much, but they, um, okay. Yeah, it, it'll it'll click in. Just put about two or three, and it'll 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 click in. Okay. All right. Uh, he was talking. John began his letter talking about the assurance that he. That Jesus was completely God and completely man. And that those that come to know Jesus have a change of life. You know, a change of life. You know, women hear that term, change of life, they think of something else. But we're talking about people that get saved. When you come to know Jesus Christ, our brother shared his testimony the other night. He said, I can remember the day that my life changed. Because that's what salvation is about. That's what knowing Jesus is about. He's, he's, he'll take you as you are, but he's not going to leave you as you are. And John expressed that in, in the first part of this letter. He talked about sin, and he told us not to sin. He says, but if we do, if we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, uh, our, our advocate, my attorney, he happens to be the son of the judge. There's not only you see the son of the judge, but he already paid my fine. He paid my penalty. That's our attorney. That's our advocate. And we said that he was writing this letter to address the heresy that we called Gnosticism, which is still here today, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Gnosticism was a, 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 really a philosophy, and it, it covered a, a wide range of, of, different kinds of different kinds of religions. It kind of uh, ran the whole gamut. But it basically dealt with salvation by knowledge. Salvation by knowledge. That to be saved, to enter into heaven, or enter into a relationship with deity, it's, there's, there's knowledge that you have to obtain through special teachers and so forth and uh, going through certain levels, and we've heard things like that before. And that's prevalent today. A lot of it under the guise of Christianity. And he talked about the evidences of our faith. He talked about love, that if we are truly followers of Jesus Christ, we will love. We will love. Sometimes it takes the power of God to help us love some folks, doesn't it? And there's probably a few folks that think that about us, too. <laughs> and say, you know, Pastor Corman, man, I don't know about loving him. But somebody, you know, it takes the power of God. Remember I said loving isn't necessarily wanting to be their best buddy. But loving means, you know, the agape love that, that Christ had for us that took him to the cross. It's an evidence of our faith. We have love. We have obedience. Uh, we read last week about, you know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is, is uh, enmity with God. So we, we we're reading about love and light and obedience. And, and here in verse 18, John begins a section where he wants to warn us. He wants to make us aware of the danger. Timothy said, uh, Paul said to Timothy, there's peril, perilous times that's coming. Dangerous times. It's dangerous. Spiritual, there's, there's danger in the spiritual realm. Remember that robot on, you know, danger, Will Robin. There's danger in the spiritual realm. And we need to be aware of it, and we need to be aware how it comes and what it's about, and how we can recognize it. And he says this. We read it last week. We'll, we'll pick it up in verse 18. Little children, it's the last time. Remember we said that term last time, the term last is the word eschatos, which we get our term eschatology. 
And the, and the word time there could be translated hour. And basically, John was saying, you know, he could come back at any time. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. The early apostles taught that Jesus could come back any day in that time. Somebody said, well, it's been 2,000 years. Where is he? Well, we know that Peter says a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years like a day. And what happened after so many hundreds of years of Jesus not coming back, uh, a, a lot of different kinds of theology started to arise. Uh, perhaps you've heard of a fellow named Augustine, uh, who was a great, supposedly a great theologian. He came up with the idea that uh, you know, Jesus wasn't really coming back but that really, you know, the church here, the church now is the kingdom of God. Because they used to teach that Jesus, I mean, the, the Bible teaches that Jesus will come back and establish a millennial kingdom that we read about in Revelation and so forth. But when that wasn't happening after 300, 400 years, uh, the church started saying, well, hey, what's going on here? And after the church became uh, the, the politically correct thing to do at the hands of Constantine, the emperor, about 300 A.D., or a little past that, uh, they figured, hey, this is it. This is the kingdom of God. This is, what, this is what they were talking about. It must have been all just symbols and figures, and, and this is what it was really about. And they would say there are people today believe that you know, the church represents the kingdom of God. Man, if this is the kingdom of God, I mean, the kingdom of God dwells within us. How many people know that? The kingdom is here. The Holy Spirit is here. But when we look around us, they're talking about in a very, very natural circumstance of, oh, the kingdom of God is on earth. Well, it's on earth in the hearts of believers, but it sure isn't on earth in the seats of government in the world. Uh, we're waiting for the kingdom of God to manifest itself here and when Jesus comes back, when the king comes back, okay? But in the very beginning, at the very beginning of the church, when you write the, uh, read the writings of the apostles, they expected that Jesus could come back any time and establish his kingdom. And they taught that. And they taught that we should always be ready. That's 2,000 years later. It still applies. We're in the last time. The, the next prophetic thing to happen from that till now is Christ coming back. Might not be for another 2,000 years. I kind of think it's going to be sooner than that. But whatever it is, that's the next thing. So we're living in that last age, waiting for Christ to come back. He said it's the last time. And as you, have, you have uh, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my mouth isn't working good. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, See, some folks think, well, this teaching about all this, you know, pre-trib, antichrist, that's just the last couple hundred years. Well, they were talking about him back then. So there's going to be an antichrist, one who will oppose Christ. That's all it means. An opposition to Christ. Satan's anointed, as Christ is God's anointed. Okay? He says, you've heard that antichrist shall come, but let me fill you in on something. Even now, there are many... Antichrist. Later on in this letter, he talks about the spirit of Antichrist. There's a spirit of Antichrist. It's alive and well in the world. It was alive back in his day. It was alive during the Tower of Babel. The spirit, anything that opposes Christ. And he's going to begin to tell us how we can tell the Antichrist. Everybody's trying to figure out who the Antichrist is going to be. But what we need to do is not try to think about who the Antichrist, the end time world ruler beast is going to be. We need to figure out who the Antichrists are right now. Because I'm not going to have to deal with him. But the ones who are here now, they're the ones I got to wrestle with. Okay? Listen to what he says. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last day. And he said this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, he's not talking here about people who have, you know, left one fellowship and went to another or whatever. You know, sometimes we, we think that, you know, and we've all known people and some of us have, you know, gone from one church to another. That's not what he's dealing with. He's dealing with this on a doctrinal platform. He's not talking about somebody who just left this church and went to another church. Yeah, back then, they all met in houses. They didn't have churches. Okay? But he's not talking about it. He's talking about people that have turned their back on the faith. People that have changed. They once believed, or at least said they believed, the doctrine of Christ, and they've changed. 
They've gone off preaching, teaching something else. And we've seen a lot of that today. But it was going on back in his day. Just like it's going on today. Look at, I want you to read a couple of verses with me. Uh, turn with me uh, over to uh, 1 Timothy. The very end of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just, <coughs> just getting some examples that we can read that was going on in, in his day. That's going on today too. The very last verse, in uh, the, uh, uh, the next to the last verse, verse 20, 1 Timothy 6 and 20. I've given the message a couple times called Science Falsely So-Called. I feel that coming on again. <laughs> okay. That's coming back. I've got to brush up my, my PowerPoint on that one. It's coming back. But anyway. O Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes, Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. There are people who have turned from the faith because they've been convinced that science, quote-unquote, has proven the gospel wrong. They've been convinced, and this has gone on now, you know, since like the theory of evolution has come, you know, come on the scene a few hundred years ago. There are, there are churchmen and women and theologians that have tried to adjust the, doc, adjust the doctrine of Christ to fit what science has, or quote unquote, science has said. Science falsely so called. Evolution is not good science. It's not. It's fake science. But we've been so, uh, some folks have been so bowled over by guys who could use big words and have PhDs at the end of their name. And say, oh, and they've tried to adjust, they've tried to change what this says to facilitate the quote-unquote scientists. Okay? And what has happened? They have fallen from the faith. Seminaries, denominations, uh, uh, people, churches that once preached the gospel, once preached the blood of Jesus Christ, now they, they bring into question because, well, that stuff about Adam was just made up. We can't believe that. So what's this thing about Christ having, you know, by one man sin entered in, by another man uh, sin was, you know, uh, forgiveness was given? Uh, so they say, well, what's that all about? See, if you, if you take the block out of the foundation, the whole place falls. And that's been Satan's tool now for several hundred years, to convince people that this science has proven. Science hasn't proven anything. You know, the evidence is the same whether you believe in science or creation. The evidence is the same. It's how you interpret it. And I'm not going to get into a big thing. I'll save that for that message. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that then. But science falsely so-called. People have left the faith because they've been convinced that, you know, people that don't believe in the supernatural, and, and a lot of these scientists who... Uh, believe in evolution and all this other stuff, they, they reject the idea that there's a supernatural realm. You know, they believe in parallel universes and all this other crazy stuff. If you ever watch the Science Channel, it's all kinds of crazy things they believe in. But they can't believe in a supernatural realm. So they say, well, all this stuff about God and Jesus, you know, okay. Turn now with me just a couple pages over to uh, 2 Timothy Chapter 2. Just, these are just some examples that they had to face, okay, about the spirit of Antichrist. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse uh, 15. The Apostle Paul writes, <clears throat> Study, study. He doesn't say, uh, Pastor Harold always says, don't read the word, study the word. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. You know, I've encountered a lot of people that have come to me with objections to the gospel. And every once in a while, somebody will say something that will like kind of stump you. But you know what I found out? I mean, I'm no great genius or no great debater. But, you know, if you study this word, the answers are there. You don't have to be, you don't have to have an IQ of 200 to understand what this word says. You just got to study a little bit, Okay. Now listen to what he said. But shun profane and vain babblings, like what you hear on the TV sometimes. Okay. For they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does a canker or a cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. These two guys, you don't know much about them, but here's what Paul says about them. Who concerning the truth 
have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Here, some. Here were these two guys that must have been involved in the church, in the body, he must have heard teachings and preaching and so forth. And they went around saying, hey, Jesus, Jesus has already been here and gone. And when they said that, a lot of people who had faith figured they missed, they missed Christ. And their faith became shipwrecked. Here were these people, they were part of them. They were part of the church. They had heard teachings, they looked... They looked like they were part of the church. They might have had, you know, an experience. They might have confessed, you know, their, their sin and asked Jesus to forgive them. But now they're teaching error. And they left, they left the church because they wanted to teach error. They were, they were with us, but they weren't of us because if they were of us, they'd still be with us. But they left us. Just another example, okay? Turn a couple pages over to... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Just a couple more of these. And verse, look at verse 9. <clears throat> Paul's writing to Timothy. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Why? For Demas, if you look that name up, you find out at one time Demas was a very profitable member of Paul's, Paul's band of believers. But he says, Demas has forsaken me why? Having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. This Demas, which was once with me, he was a fellow laborer with me. He fell in love with the world. Remember what John said in, back there in chapter 2? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Lust of the flesh, the lust, of the, lust of the eye, the pride of life. Demas got himself caught up in that. And he left. It could very well be that he was not of us. He was with us, but he left us because he wasn't one, wasn't one of us. Doctrinally, he didn't just get mad and go to some other church or go, go with somebody else. He doctrinally, he, he forsook the truth of the gospel. It's almost like when Jesus was talking about those hardened hearts, you know, the, the planting of the seed in, in the soil, that some was hard and some had thorns and some had uh, rocks and they left. One more. One more I, I, I want to read. And, and we're going to bring this a little uh, closer home. Look at Colossians. Uh, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. In chapter 2. And let's... Let's, uh, let's flip these. Okay. Let's start with verse... Let's start with verse 6. I added a few verses here. <clears throat> As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith. What does that mean? That means planted. That means growing. That means studying God's word. That means learning. That means growing. Rooted and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 8. Beware. Be, beware. If they had to beware in the first century, how about now? They didn't have TBN back then. They didn't have satellite stations and 400 religious programs going on with all kinds of people saying all kinds of crazy stuff. They didn't have YouTube with every, any kind of nut with a camera can get on YouTube and say anything he wants to. He says, beware, lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy? Oh, the, the learning, the, the inte intellectual Acceptance of theological truth. Adjusted, stretched, bent out of shape to fit our preconceived notions. That's what philosophy is. You know, I could never understand how somebody could have a job being a philosopher. You know, what, what do philosophers do? They sit around and they think and teach. That's all they do. They got nothing better to do, so they think and they write books and people buy their books and, okay. But they, but they do. Instead of, instead of studying God's word, they make things up in their minds. There were whole schools. You know, you know uh, shortly, we're going to be traveling to Germany. You know that. And, and there was a place in Germany called Tübingen. There was a, there was a, 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 
a school of theology there. And they had all these theologians, and they came up with some of the craziest ideas you could imagine. They didn't have nothing better to do but to sit around and think. They should have been studying God's Word. And that's what happens. When people don't bother to study the Word and pray and seek God's face and, and hear good teaching based on God's Word, they'll start make, they can make up anything. And we'll talk about that in a minute, too. But listen to what he said. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Drop down a little bit. Uh, look at verse uh, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Well, if you've got to be saved, you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to worship on Saturday. If you're really saved, you're not going to eat. You know, you're going to follow the Mosaic food law. You know, they, they, people try to push all kinds of, you know, Old Testament legalistic stuff on you, saying if you don't do this, then you can't get to heaven. Paul says forget that because Jesus took all that on himself. He says in verse 17 that these are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. He goes on and he says this. Let no man beguile you of your reward in the voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. We talked about them last week. Everybody's so enthralled with angels. Angels, angels. Don't let anybody rob you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding uh, into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. This is like 80% of the stuff you hear on TV. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. You know, a, a large amount of stuff that you hear on TV is people trying to give you knowledge that they think will make you closer to God. But it's not knowledge based on the teaching of Scripture. He says in verse 20, we're back in 1 John now. He says, you know, they, were, uh, they, they went out from us, they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Verse 20. <laughs> but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. See, if you're a believer, if Jesus Christ is living inside of you, then you have truth inside of you. You have an anointing. Now, somebody might read that and say, well, well if, if I know all things, why do I need to hear somebody teach me? Okay, it's like having a talent. If you know anybody, anybody here musical? You can play music. You have a talent, musical talent. Some people have artistic talent, okay? I can play guitar, but I can't draw a picture for anything. If I draw a picture, you don't, won't recognize what that is. Okay, but I, have, you know, I can play some music. Somebody might, might have an artistic talent. Somebody, might, somebody else might have talents in you know, business and so forth. A talent is something that's given to us, but talents have to be developed. You might have a natural talent, and there are some people, some very, very rare people, that can just sit down and play. I don't know if you ever saw... There was a, I saw a program one time when one of these autistic kids, he could hear a song and play it like, like it was a tape recorder, just play it right out. You know, he has certain giftings and certain things going on in his brain. But most of us, if we have a talent, we have to develop it. We have to learn the technique and so forth, and that's important. It's just like with the Word. We have the Spirit dwelling inside of us. It's the Spirit of truth. But God gives us apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors uh, and evangelists to help us develop that and grow and mature in the Lord. If it wasn't for that, everybody would be instant, automatic, just, you know, super saints. But we got to grow. we got to mature. And how do we do that? We have the word in us. We know what the truth is. And that unction that he's talking about here is that thing inside of you that if you hear something that's wrong, there's going to be something inside of you that's going to click. And you might not be able to tell exactly what it is. But how many people here can testify that you've heard things before that you said, wait a minute. It might sound good. When I first got saved, I was listening to everybody I could get my ears around. Even before I was start, started to go to a church. I hadn't found a church. So every, anybody on TV, on the radio, I would listen to everybody. And I found out early on that not everybody was saying the same thing. And there was something inside of me that was kind of picking and choosing and saying, this ain't right. 
I didn't understand it, but I knew there was something. And it wasn't until I got down with you know, Pastor Spencer, and he was, he was together in the Word, and I would ask him things, and he would teach me. He would show me. But I had that unction. I had that thing inside of me. He says in verse 21, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. He says, who is a liar but he that denies Jesus is Christ? What's the test? What's the bottom line? What's the acid test? How can we tell? Things we hear. The doctrinal test of those who have left and who are teaching another gospel. Jesus said, my word is truth. When Pontius Pilate, you know, what is truth? Jesus said, my word is truth. His word is truth. The doctrinal test of truth. Jesus is the Christ, the Father and the Son, His blood cleansing us from all sin. These are basic doctrinal things that every believer ought to have locked into their brain, into their spirit, into their soul. About 130 years ago, a fellow named Charles Taze Russell lived in the north side of Pittsburgh. He was raised in the Presbyterian Church. As he grew older, he denied hell, he denied the Trinity, denied the deity of Christ, denied the presence of the Holy Spirit, started Jehovah's Witnesses. Back in the early 1800s, a fellow named Joseph Smith was raised in the upstate New York during what they called the Second Great Awakening. He denied hell, Trinity, deity of Christ, person of the Holy Spirit, started the Mormons. I'm a Mormon. Hi, I'm running for president, and I'm a Mormon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy, raised a, a New England Congregationalist, started Christian Science, denied hell, denied the Trinity, denied the deity of Christ, mind over matter, knowledge, esoteric knowledge that we can, we can garner from things. Manuel Swedenborg lived in the 1700s. Brilliant man. He raised, he was raised during the Reformation. Denied hell, denied the Trinity, deed of Christ. Started what they call Swedenborgism. Maybe you've heard of that. The new church. Really out there. They're, they're, I mean, they're out there. And they're all doctors and lawyers and everything else, but they're out there. Okay? Today we have what's called the emergent church. In its, various, in its various forms. Various people. Not all of them, but some of them, they're denying hell. They're denying, they're, they're denying the infallibility of the Word of God. Well, that, that Bible, we need to reinvent it. We need to reinvent what, what the Bible says about the church. We need to have a more modern... We need to make the Bible fit us, just like those who want to try to make the Constitution fit the way things are going on in the United States of America. All these ones, they all had, they all look like, they all look like Christians on the outside, go to a Christian church, went to a Christian church, uh, learned the theology, had the cross on the wall, studied in the seminary, cemetery. <laughs> Yet they begin to deny the faith. Carlton Pearson, how many have heard that name? Come up under uh, Oral Roberts, you know, charismatic preacher, dynamic preacher. He come to the recognition someday, there's no hell. Everybody goes to heaven. He was of us. He looked like us. Preached. He preached and people be coming down, laying on the altar. Slain in the spirit. Boom. See, that gets me sometimes. Some of these guys have this anointing, and the next thing you know, they're on another planet. Doctrinally. I'm not talking about the ones that maybe fall into sin. There's some that do that, and, and, and God, you know, can bring them back. And God can, I'm, not, I'm talking about doctrinally. I'm talking about according to God's word. They deny the faith. They went out from us because they weren't of us. They looked like they were. We thought they were for a while. 
He says this. Look at verse, uh, where were we? 21. I have not written you unto you because you know uh, not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. I'm trying to encourage. I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to take this, this unction that you have in you and help it develop. Who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the anointed Christ. That's what the word Christ means, the anointed. He who denies that Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh, he is an antichrist. We have large denominations of Pentecostals that deny the Trinity. They say you've got to be baptized. They say you've got to speak in tongues. You've got to be part of their group. But they don't believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They deny the teaching of God's Word. Talk in tongues. People were slain in the Spirit. Boom. You know, spiritual, oh, everything, buddy, jumping and dancing to music and people running. Where's that coming from? Because it says right here that if they deny that Jesus is the anointed, they're an antichrist. And they deny the Father and the Son. Not the Father or the Son. But they deny the Father and the Son. Reading on a little bit more. <laughs> Listen to what he says. Whosoever denies the Son... The same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. Let the truth, it's so important, we can never Take the truth for granted. We can never pretend like the truth isn't important. There are those who want to discard doctrinal truths for unity in what we call the body of Christ, or what is called the church. Listen, I'm all for unity, but it better be based on God's Word. I'm all for getting with other believers and other churches and other pastors. That's wonderful. But we all better believe what this Word says. Because I can't unify with somebody that denies what this word says. I don't care how holy they are. I don't care how nice they are. They might be good people. I don't care. I can't, I can't pray with somebody that is praying to a different God than I. It's his word. Pray for him. I can, I can, I can appreciate him. I, I'm not looking down my nose at anybody. I don't want to stand in judgment or be critical of anybody. But I can't yoke myself with unbelievers. And I sure can't yoke myself with somebody with under the guise of Christ is preaching falsehood. Look at verse 26. Just a few more verses, we're close. He says, These things I have written unto you concerning him that seduce you. Don't you know, when we talk about Antichrist and the work of Satan, you know, he works in the realm of politics and he works in the realm of, you know, the economy and he works out there. But you know where his, his prime place of action is? Right here. He likes to come in to the body and fit right in and slowly. So, see, he's saying he wants to seduce us. He wants to, we know what that means. You know, it's like bait in a trap. You know, a trap isn't any good unless it has a good bait in it. If you just throw a fishing hook in a lake, you ain't going to catch anything. But you've got to put something on it that the fish is going to like. They come in. They creep into unawares. They, through the TV screen. Just imagine if they would have TV back then. You know, they creep in. And they have a good music. 
And people are jumping and running. And they, and they say about 98% stuff that could be true, but that 2%, they seduce. They promise you things that God doesn't promise. He promised us eternal life. We just read it. He never promised us that we would get a hundredfold return on our... He can give it. He can bless. It says he'll bless our giving. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in our bank account. He'll bless giving. He, that's, that's part of God's word. That's the truth of God's word. That when we give, he, he gives back. He blesses that. He, he honors that. But they've taken that and they've made it an investment plan. God didn't make it that way. At least not in the, in the natural. Jesus said, lay for yourself up treasures in heaven. So the things that we do here, you know, he, he, could, he could bless us back with, with material goods if we use them for his glory. He can do anything he wants to. But ultimately, my treasure, when I die, I'm leaving all that stuff behind. I want to lay up treasures in heaven. Reading a little bit more. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. You see, when I stand up here or somebody stands up here and preaches the word, you have everything you need within you to discern whether what I'm saying is right or wrong. You have that Holy Spirit and you have the word of God. You can test me, you can prove me or anybody that stands up here. You can prove according to God's word. It's there for everybody. It, it doesn't require, you know, going up levels, uh, you know, certain, you know, degrees. You know, first and second, third degree, Blue Lodge, and you're going up to, you know, the 33rd Shrine. Or it's just all this knowledge. The moment you're saved, you receive an unction from the Holy One. Reading a little bit more. It says in verse 28, and we're going to close with these next few verses. Little children, abide in him. Live in him. Let him be your abode. Let him be your dwelling place. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, constantly. Be in Christ. Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him in his coming. See, now, now John is talking about, you know, he was talking about the Antichrist, now he's talking about the real Christ. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love has be the Father has bestowed unto us that we should be called the sons of God. This love he's talking about here is the word agape. But it's, it doesn't have the same connotation as it does where it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. God loved the world and he gave his son Jesus that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish. This love he's talking about here is it's a little more personal. It's a little more intimate. For those that have come to Christ, we have an intimate relationship with the Father through Jesus. That we can be called the sons of God. People that aren't saved can't be called the sons of God. Everybody says, well, we're all children of God. No, we're not. No, we're not. The only way a person can claim God as their father it's through faith in Jesus Christ. To anybody else, he's the judge that offers salvation. But if they refuse salvation, they'll be judged. But to those that have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, we become sons and daughters. He becomes our Abba. It says in Romans, we no longer have the spirit of fear, but we have the spirit of adoption where we can cry, Abba, Father. Those out there, those that left us because they weren't, they don't have that option. There are people that, that think this Christianity thing is a bunch of re religious dogma and doctrines and so forth. We believe in teaching doctrine, but this Christianity thing is a relationship with the Father through faith in the Son. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. See, if you have a relationship with God, if you know him, if you really know him, 
that no scientist is going to convince you that he doesn't exist. No cult leader is going to convince you that he doesn't exist. No, no false teacher is going to exist to you that it's just all make-believe. Because we have a personal relationship. We've had a personal encounter with the creator of the universe. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, oh, listen, if you don't, if you don't remember anything else, when he shall appear, we're going to be like him. When he shall appear in his glory, we're going to be like him because we're going to see him as he is. We're going to see him like I'm looking at you right now. Like you're looking at me. We're going to look at, can you just imagine when we lay our eyes on Christ? Just imagine that. Forget about them pictures you've seen all your life of Jesus. Forget them. I can't imagine. We're going to see him. The world's not going to see him. They'll, they'll, when he comes in his glory and his brightness, like lightning from the east to the west, they're going to hide their heads. But when we see him, it's going to be like, you ever see the pictures when the soldiers come back and the kids see their daddy? So I, I just feel kind of like the spirit wants to press that in somebody's, right, somebody's spirit right now. We're going to see him as he, just as he is. He's not going to come dressed like nobody but himself. And every man, listen, here's, and we're going to end with this verse. And every man that has this hope, or woman, if you're hoping to see him, if you know that someday you're going to lay your eyes on Christ, and he's going to, he's going to lay his eyes on you, if you know that, you know what that causes us to do? It causes us to take a good look and purify ourselves. Because every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I want to be ready when Jesus comes back. I mean, I'm ready now. I got the Holy Spirit. I'm born again. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Born again. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. With the old time Pentecost. That's all right. But you see, when he comes back, I don't want to be ashamed. When he comes back, I want him to be able to look at me and say, well done. See, this is why we examine ourselves. This is, this is why we take a look at ourselves. This is why we study God's word. This is why we, we look and say, Lord, if there's something that's not like you, can you please help me change? Not, not to earn salvation. Not to make ourselves acceptable because we've been made acceptable by his blood. But because I have this relationship with my father, I want to be everything he wants me to be. I want to be righteous. I'm not always righteous. I get in the flesh. Bless of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It happens to me. It happens to all of us. I got to go. I got to confess my sins. I got to, I got to, you know, believe what God's word said. He's going to cleanse me, uh, forgive me, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. We all have these things we struggle with. But all the days coming, that He's going to lay His eyes on me. I'm going to lay my eyes on Him, and that's true for every one of you. And this personal relationship I have with God. It's not based on my friendship with you. It's not based on my marriage. It's not based on my uh, credentials from the church. It's not based on any of that. But based on nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're going to see him as he is. And we're going to be like him. That's something to look forward to. And if that doesn't make you want to be everything God wants you to be, huh? He's promised us life eternal. See that Antichrist stuff? He's got that covered. He'll take care of him. That spirit of Antichrist, he'll let us know. 
He'll let us know. He lets us know all the time. But this relationship that we have with the Father, oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called, who am I that you are mindful of me? I am a friend of God. No, I'm more than a friend. I'm a son. Amen.